So Dr. Dr. Lala or Dr. Boudry? What, what do people like to call you? I've, Dr. Lala has always been easier. That's what everyone calls me, my friends, my family. So Dr. Lala it is. With all this stuff that's going on with the, you know, you know, COVID and coronavirus, I know it's like your first year as an emergency medicine resident. When did you, I guess my question is like, when did you start feeling comfortable with ER, you know, as a, as a resident? Because I remember when I was an intern in medicine, it definitely took about three, three, four months before I was comfortable. And I was, I don't even know how my, I don't know how my patients were, were alive because I was like, <laughs> I was like definitely just this kind of going with the flow, but like for you in ER, um, I guess like how did how did when did you start feeling just comfortable doing stuff in there? Oh man, I don't even think I'm still comfortable. I think I'm still learning, and every day is so challenging. Um, I was on a lot of off-service rotations, uh, doing anesthesia, ultrasound, medicine floors, ICU. Um, those are all part of the curriculum was part of your first year. And then now I'm back in the ED. So every day feels new and different. And we have such amazing volume at my hospital. We average about 100,000 patients a year. And we're a trauma one center on top of that. So we get a lot of um, trauma, penetrating trauma. And I work in East New York, which, you know, has a lot of that. So you're never really comfortable. And I think if you're ever comfortable in the ER, that's when you should be afraid. That's, that's what the saying is. So um, but I mean, my team is very supportive. There's always someone there with you. Any procedure that needs to be done, you're always going to be supervised. But it's also good because you get a lot of training. And so getting that exposure early on, by the time you're done in three years, like you're a rock star. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like a lot of people, you know, especially fourth years about to transition in ER or in medicine, they're wondering how, you know, what it's going to be like. And so I think your story is, is actually really unique in a sense, because you're from LA, right? Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I grew up in LA and I came to New York for residency and I happen to now be a first year resident in one of the biggest pandemics that has taken over the US in a really long time. Um, and everyone knows New York is one of the busiest places. The streets are so packed, the subways, everywhere you go, there's a line and it's like ghost town now, you know? It's, it's so different. Um, and then as an intern, you know, they kind of slowly ease you in. You don't get that many responsibilities in the beginning and you have a lot more like supervision, but now they expect you to function at a higher level just because we need that extra help. You know, everyone's stretching themselves so thin. So it's basically like having to, to grow up much faster than you thought you needed to. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I could see that, that going that direction. And I, I mean, so in talking about like COVID and seeing patients that have COVID, what, what do you, what do you feel, I guess, how, how does it look like from, from the doctor perspective? How does COVID look like? Cause we hear about what it can do. We hear about, uh, you know, the numbers from the other end, but I think you being frontline, what does that look like when you've seen a patient with COVID and, and sort of the natural history and how they present and all that? Yeah, uh, I think when it first was becoming a known thing and everyone was talking about COVID and, um, you know, we were getting the patients that were really sick. We were getting patients that were severely short of breath. They were very dysnic. They looked like they were on their last breath. They were older, 80, 90 year old patients, nursing home patients, shelter patients, um, you know, completely like unable to saturate on their own. They're coughing. They have high fevers of 102 and 3. And that's what we were used to seeing in the very beginning. Um, and now within the last couple of weeks, we've just been thrown completely off course. We're getting people who are afebrile sometimes. We're getting people who are just coming in with a slight cough, um, sometimes just generalized body aches. Like it's become very nonspecific symptoms. Um, and within a matter of hours, these patients can crash so quickly. Um, it's really gotten to the point where we're intubating about in each hour, a patient per hour is having to be intubated. <laughs> patient per hour is that per hour hour? yeah do you do you you feel like the numbers that are being quoted are actually you know accurate do you do you you think that that do do you get a sense that there's under reporting or do you feel like there's over reporting or just reporting Uh, i know know we don't have like actual numbers in front of us but you know we've seen the media um what's kind of your sense about it i think we're probably definitely under reporting um, we're under-reporting, we're under-testing, but that's also to protect the public from this like crazy panic and uproar. We want to keep people calm. We want people to feel safe. We want them to feel like we have the situation handled. But unfortunately, now it's becoming 
um, a real issue and it's starting to affect young people. It's no longer just old people with multiple comorbidities. It is affecting a lot of younger people. Um, sometimes those younger people tend to have multiple comorbidities, whether they have things like, you know, diabetes or any congenital problems or um, any type of immunocompromised states, HIV, cancer, those are going to make you more susceptible to the virus. But um, we've seen it in 30, 40 year old patients and it's becoming an issue that's not really been talked about as of yet. And I think people are not taking it as seriously as they should because it's a real problem now. Well, I think, I think that there is a lot of discussion about older people getting it. Do you think that it's, it's you know, obviously, I, I, you know, it seems like older people are more likely to die from it. Mm -hmm. um, but are you seeing more patients that are, you know, being, you know, that are being brought into the hospital that are young? Um, yeah, definitely. A lot of patients who are a lot of, they're younger, but a lot of them also have been like hypertensive diabetics. So I, you know, haven't seen like someone who's healthy, you know, works out, takes care of themselves, lives a really kosher lifestyle and comes in and has been sick. I haven't seen that personally. Most of the young people that I have seen have been, um, you know, whether they're homeless or they live in shelters or somewhere in close quarters with other people that possibly can contaminate them. Um, or each other. So but I'm, it's too soon to tell. We don't have enough data to say, but from my experience, that's what we've been seeing is people who are generally younger, but also have been sick too. Yeah. And, and um, you know, on, on a personal level, I actually have uh, a close person to me, not, not physically close. You know, <laughs> I'd be quarantined right now, um, but I actually have a, a person that's really close to me that actually had um, coronavirus and they mm -hmm. were, um, they were young, they were, you know, they were sort of, I think, 30 years old and uh, healthy, um, went to the gym, really buff, you know, getting yeah. where I would want to be, you know what I mean? So, I don't, <laughs> I, you know, if they had coronavirus, and, you know, I don't know what I would be like if I got it. Right? Um, we all are like, yeah, at risk, yeah. <laughs> it, opened, it opened my eyes a little bit to sort of, um, you know, how, how crazy this thing can be. I'm extremely healthy and probably the <laughs> most in shape fit person that I know. Um, before we, we finish or, you know, we end the, the uh, podcast, I wanted you to look at a quick video. I'm going to share my screen here in a second. So I just want to see what you think of this video. And I want to see sort of, um, you know, if it, if, you know, does this video accurately, you know, depict sort of what your experience is in New York. Uh, the New York Times just recently put, uh, put this video up. All the meat that you see, they all have COVID. The frustrating thing about all of this is it really just feels like it's too little too late. Like we knew, we knew it was coming. Today is kind of getting worse and worse. We had to get a refrigerated truck to store the bodies of patients who are dying. We are right now scrambling to try to get a few additional ventilators or even CPAP machines. If we could get CPAP machines, we could free up ventilators for patients who need them. The resource thing is true as well, where, where you're feeling, you know, the not having enough resources and all that. Um, is that, do you feel that that way as well from your, your hospital? A lot of our co-residents, our attendings have used their personal money to buy stuff, buy supplies, uh, reached out to organizations that were kind enough to donate to us. But unfortunately, it's still not enough. It's really an issue and people are definitely exposing themselves and not donning in the proper gear and the equipment that they need. Um, I can relate to her saying that there's just so many dead bodies at our hospital. Our morgue as of yesterday was full. Um, we have not gone to the extent of needing a refrigerated truck and I hope it doesn't reach that point, but um, it seems that it's gonna get that bad, absolutely. This is exactly how my hospital looks. It had me having so many questions about the virus. Uh, you know, do you, do you find that you're kind of having to grow up really fast as a, as a first year and especially it's approaching the end of the year of your first year so I'm assuming you kind of have you're kind of a pseudo second year <laughs> you're you know kind of a, a first year at the same time and so with that in mind do you feel like your skills have gotten a lot better as a doctor through all this yeah absolutely so things definitely have to move a lot faster now um 
there's definitely still supervision there because patient safety is obviously always going to be first, but you're going to just be doing a lot more, a lot more crash central lines. Um, you've got to get really skilled at your ultrasound if you need to with these patients coming in with a lot of respiratory issues, being able to do, you know, like an echo really quickly um, and look at the lungs and see if you see anything abnormal in lung sliding, fluid overload, um, just anything from like suturing, any type of lacerations that come in, you got to really pick up the pace now. It's, it's challenging, it's intimidating, but um, yeah, you got to be like a super second year now as an intern. And even I've heard a lot of like um, medical students are graduating early and starting residency now just so that they can join and help out. That's how crazy. That's crazy. Right? Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine, I couldn't even, uh, you know, as a fourth year med student, you know, the, the residents did all the orders and did all the, I couldn't even imagine yeah. coming into, the, you know, this whole Corona pa uh, virus yeah. pandemic. I don't know what it's like to graduate med school early. Well, even after I finished the entire four years of medical school and I started as an intern, I still felt like a medical student. I still felt like I didn't know anything. You never really feel like you know anything um, until you're actually doing it. You know, as a, you know, as a senior resident, in ophthalmology, my eyes have been open, no, no pun intended. <laughs> That's my, good. My eyes have been open to sort of um, just like, you know, really what it comes down to it, being a doctor and what we're exposed mm -hmm. to. I think you, you obviously, you're the first line uh, in the, the ER. And I think that, you know, I just want to say, you know, thank you. I, mm -hmm. I think you're going to inspire a lot of people. I was looking, I was looking at your Instagram, um, uh, cause that's what we do in, in 2020, you know, other than, <laughs> Yeah, we uh, look at people's Twitters and Instagrams and, and Facebooks. And I, and I saw that you had gone back to was it Sudan? Yeah. Yeah. And so when I saw that you had done some volunteer work there and there was some sort of um, there was some big disaster that was going on there and, yeah. and you were kind of on the front lines there as well. How, how, how was so it seems like you're used to kind of craziness, do you, do you, you know, craziness. And what was like briefly, what was the situation like that in Sudan? And then how do you feel like that helps you with, you know, dealing with the coronavirus? Yeah. So at that time, um, it was um, just a few months back, actually, and less than a year ago now, we were going through a revolution and our president finally, after multiple months of protesting and um, he finally, you know, stepped down. But with that, uh, it was not easy for them to step down. The military started to openly fire at people who were peacefully protesting. Um, there's a lot of just like wounded um, uh, protesters everywhere. And I was just graduating medical school. I went back home to celebrate with my family. because They all still live out there. Did not expect to find myself in that situation. Um, I had just found out I matched into ER, but nowhere have I ever been in a situation like that. But your natural instinct is to want to help and do the best that you can, whether it's, you know, control, controlling any type of bleeding, putting in IVs, resuscitation, just the basics to save someone's life. Um, that was amazing. And that was probably the moment for me that was like, yeah, I knew ER was for me, you know? So as scary as it is, it was the best experience ever. Um, but now it's like, we're battling this thing here and it, it feels like that all over again. Thank you for, you know, for everything you're doing, you know, for being on the front lines. Um, and I think you're an amazing, you know, you have an amazing platform, on, you know, even on your social media. Um, I know you don't think anybody's watching, but people are always watching. <laughs> philosophy, you know, not just Uncle Sam, not just whoever. People are always just <laughs> watching, right? And I think that um, there's a lot of people who have questions who are saying, hey, uh, I'm interested in doing what you do, you know, you, you didn't wait till you were in attending or later on to, you know, be involved in some, you know, for example, the Sudan situation, obviously COVID, you can't, you could, you didn't have a choice over that. Um, but for someone who is just interested in going into ER and they're saying, I want to be an ER doctor, other than going to med school and everything, I guess, do you have any kind of words for that person? Um, I would definitely say that it doesn't matter what level of skill or training that you have, you can always get involved, whether it's volunteering at your local like EMS or firefighters, joining organizations like Red Cross, um, Doctors Without Borders, anything, you know, in your school, they have emergency medicine clubs that you can be a part of and help out. Um, volunteering at any hospital nearby, you can make a difference. It doesn't matter. And all of that stuff is just further kind of help you along the way when you finally make that decision that you do want to go into emergency medicine or any type of critical care background. So 
Um, it's never too early to start. You can even from teenage years, like when you're 15, 16 years old, start volunteering. It's really important. It'll build up that resume for you. So when you are ready to apply, you're just going to be so impressive. There's no way they could turn you down. But New York's a great place. When all this is over, I can't wait to get back out there and enjoy what New York has to offer. It's such a it's a fun place to be. There's anything and everything you'll find it in this place. I mean, New York is still a, it's a beautiful place and um, it sounds like you're getting a lot of good experience. And so thanks for joining today and good luck and be safe. I think if anyone has any questions, I'm going to give them your, um, your contact, your IG, um, and they can hit you up and contact you if they need to know anything else about emergency medicine or if they have any questions about the virus or anything like that. So thank you very much. And I hope that you have a good night.